to today's Bible study. I hope you're keeping well and I hope you enjoyed going through the songs of Solomon, the songs of songs um, with Pastor Mary. It, it, it's quite different, isn't it? And there is nothing wrong with being different. You know, that's something that I like about the Bible. It covers almost every part of life. Anyway, we will be commencing on the book of Isaiah today. The book of Isaiah is, is one of the most poetic books of the Bible. Um, it was majorly written by the prophet Isaiah. There has been in recent time speculations by uh, Bible scholars that perhaps not all the uh, chapters in the book of Isaiah was written by the prophet Isaiah. Uh, but something that is very clear is that most, if not all, the chapters in the book of Isaiah was written by the prophet. Why? Because there are certain ways of writing, certain ways of describing the way he describes God, you know, the way he talks about the nation of Israel. You, you can see that thread going all the way through um, the book um, of Isaiah. I put it this way that he would have written most of it and some of the other chapters would have been written by people very close to him equivalent of people that we call personal assistants today. But regardless of um, uh, uh, who else contributed to the book of Isaiah, let's delve in and, and see um, what God might want to show us and what he would want us to learn from the book of Isaiah. The book of Isaiah, like I said before, would have been uh, principally written by the prophet Isaiah. Now, I made an effort to refer to Isaiah as the prophet Isaiah because uh, prophet Isaiah is one of the major prophets um, of the Bible. But his, his books are not just, prof not just prophetic in nature, they are poetic in, the, in nature. They are highly descriptive as well, highly detailed. It does kind of give a hint um, of the fact that um, Isaiah would have been well educated. He would have probably, you know, belonged to the middle class or perhaps, um, uh, uh, um, you know, the upper class of his time. But there was something about this guy in the fact that one, he was educated, two, he wasn't a, he wasn't a, a mean man, he wasn't a poor man, but he, he has a hunger for the Lord. He didn't join the corruption of his time. He didn't blend into the crowd of the time. He didn't pursue, you know, what everybody around him were, were pursuing, the idolatrous nature of the people around. He didn't, he didn't adopt any of those, but he kept his eyes on God. And what I say to us is, you know, wherever we belong to on the social cadre, be it at the lower end or the upper end, we have to realize that life in itself is brave and that one day we're going to stand before a holy God who's going to judge us not based on our social status but on how well we have done with the purpose of God and the opportunity that he's given us in the land of the living. So Isaiah dedicated himself to seeking God and to pursuing God and to getting to know him more and to release the heart of God unto the people. But isn't that what the Bible said? That they that know their God shall be strong and do exploit. They that know their God shall be, shall be strong. You see, if you know your God, be, uh, regardless of what your past might be, if you know your God, God is going to give you a platform to lead others, to lead others out of darkness, to, 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 to uh, bring victory into the lives of others, to bring deliverance um, into the lives of others. Through adopting the principle of the Word of God, deliverance is brought to communities, into nations. That's why the Bible says, you shall know the truth and the truth shall set you free. So, there are certain things that are very peculiar about the book of Isaiah. I don't know if you knew them before, but if you didn't know them before, um, you might find this uh, quite interesting. Um, how many chapters um, in the whole Bible? Does anybody know? Any ideas? Yes, there are 66 books in the Bible. But guess what? There are 66 chapters in the book of Isaiah. Peculiar? I think so too. You know something else? The first half of the book of Isaiah, that's chapter 1 to chapter 39, bear strong similarities 
um, similarities to uh, the first half of the Bible that is commonly referred to as the Old Testament. It talks about the judgment of God. It talks about, you know, it talks about the nature of God, the holy nature of God. It talks about the heart of God bleeding for them, the sinfulness of his people, how they've betrayed their, their, their relationship with God and pursued other gods and, and so on and so forth. And the calamities that was going to come after them, it was quite heavy handed. And that, you know, similar, very, very strong a relationship between the first 39 chapters and the first 39 books of the Bible. The second half, on the other hand, um, talks more about the coming Messiah. Rings a bell? The New Testament. So the second half of the, of, uh, uh, of the book of Isaiah talks about the coming Messiah. He talked also about the crucifixion of the Messiah. And he also talked about the second coming of the Messiah. Amazing, 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 amazing. This guy is so beyond his time. I, 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 I often say things like, perhaps he didn't fully understand the gravity of what he was declaring at the time that he was saying it, but he was saying it as he heard it. The key thing, like Jesus said, is I don't say anything I've never heard my father say. So if God gives you a word, if God gives you an idea, if God gives you a vision, as long as it is from the Lord, it doesn't necessarily have to make sense. As long as you heard from the Lord, if it is a word to be declared, go ahead and declare it. But let's pause there a little bit. Um, how difficult do you think it might be to declare the word of God? Say, I, I'm not a prophet, you know, by the grace of God, uh, I've got an apostolic grace uh, um, on my life. But I do have, um, I do have strong prophetic ministry. Um, I can assure you that it's easier to tell somebody that it shall be well with you. It's easier to tell somebody that God is going to bless you, He's going to bless you with a new job, and, uh, you know, the wife's going to be great, the kids are going to be great, business is going to be awesome. But on the other hand, when the Lord gives you a word, there is, on the other side, like, if you don't change your life, afflictions are going to come upon you. That's not an easy word to say. Because at the time that Isaiah was prophesying, there wasn't a lack of prophets in the, in the land. But all the prophets were declaring what the people wanted to hear. They were, they were deceiving the people. They were misleading the people, saying to them, it shall be well when the Lord is saying otherwise. They were, they were more or less encouraging the people to carry on in their idolatrous ways. But Isaiah was, uh, was, was, was one of a kind. He was one of the few people who stood for righteousness who stood to declare the word of the Lord. What do you think the problem um, with that might be? What do you think the problem with, uh, with that might be? Um, I, I'll tell you what the, what the result was. Um, Isaiah wasn't well received in his time. Isaiah was, um, wasn't appreciated in his time. Ultimately, he was killed. He was sawn into two by, um, during the reign of Manasseh at the time and that that's what happens now i am not saying be suicidal in your in your in your attitude especially if god has given you a prophetic word i'm not saying be reckless and be careless um there are there are there are protocols of prophet that every prophet need to learn you need to understand that the the, that the desire of god especially under this dispensation of grace is for everyone uh, to come into repentance is for everybody to be reconciled back to God. So you, you, um, you, you don't give a word to destroy an individual. You give a word, you, you give a word even, even though it could be a word of warning, it has to be a word of hope. For example, I remember uh, several years ago the Lord gave me a word uh, uh, for somebody who um, was being tempted um, to, to do some dodgy businesses, some some, some crooked businesses. And the Lord told me, this guy, if he did it, he was going to go to jail. So I, so I said to him, uh, I, I, well, I didn't say to him, I said it to the church. The Lord is showing me that there is somebody here, you're going to get a call if you haven't, got a, if you haven't had the call already. Um, but if you did what they're asking you to do, you're going to go to jail and I will not be visiting. So if I were you, I will not do what these guys are asking me to do. 
So in a way, it's, there's a lot in that. It was a, it was a warning, but it was hope. You're not going to go to jail if you don't do it. So there was warning there. If you go, if you do it, you're going to go to jail, and things are not going to be nice. But you have a way out. Don't do it. Change your way. So there, there has to be an offer of repentance, uh, uh, and some, so many other things that a prophet has to learn. You don't just walk up to somebody and say you're going to die. You know, God doesn't desire. God doesn't desire the death of a sinner, but He wants. He wants us all to come to repentance. I know there may be people there screaming at the TV, but what if God says they're going to die? Well, um, I'm not saying God can't do that. If God tells you to tell somebody that they're going to die, well, you go ahead, you know. But um, uh, the, uh, the much I know about God is it gives, um, it gives warning and it gives a way out as well. I want you to pause here for a little bit and to, and to discuss amongst yourself. Um, what are the challenges that people face in our world today and um, how easy is it to stand apart from the crowd because in the time of Isaiah everybody almost everybody was involved in idolatry they were they were busy in a sinning and offending God but he, he was amongst the few who stood uh, aside from the crowd who stood um, in holiness uh, he made a decision to stand aside from the crowd. How easy is it to stand aside from the crowd, especially uh, for the younger generation? You know, we live in a world where uh, everybody lives for themselves. We, you know, we have we have come to that era where people have deified self. In, in other words, they say they say if it feels good, go ahead and do it. As long as it doesn't hurt somebody else, go ahead and do it. But is that always the best way to do it? Do we? Is there a third factor? What does God say about the matter? What does the Word of God say about the matter? Does that matter? Does that still count in our world today? Have a little chat about that. And the other thing I want you to chat about as well is um, how easy do you think it is to declare the Word of God in our world today? To, to speak the Word of God, to speak the Word of truth. Because the Bible talks about the end time where people will be, uh, people will, will have itchy ears. They want to hear certain things. They, they don't want to hear anything else. All they want to hear is the God bless you word. They don't want to hear change, you know, change your ways. Of course, the gospel comprises of all of this. But, uh, but the gospel in its entirety uh, includes the rebuke, the correction, and no, nobody wants that. So how easy is it to, 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 to present the word of God, to to present the Word of God in our world today. Have a quick talk about um, amongst yourself. Have a, have a quick talk. Welcome back. Well, if I may add a word or two to uh, the question that I asked earlier, we live in a world where the majority of the people want to do what is pleasing unto themselves. Of course, it's, I'm not trying to say in any, in any way, in any shape or form, that God doesn't want us to be happy. God delights in our happiness. God wants us to be happy. Yes, of course, yes, God does want us to be happy. But God wants us to leave within his will, not because he's a joy killer, but because he wants the best for us. He wants the best for us. God wants us to glorify his name. God wants us to, to adopt his, his ways because his ways are perfect. You see, something about God is he sees all. He sees beyond what we can see. And because he knows more than we we, we can possibly know, um, he goes far into the future and and map a, a path for us. And it is, um, it is a matter of choice. If you're going to adopt the, the will of God, or you're going to live for your own self, fulfilling your own goals and all of that, um, living, for your own, living for your own self and reaping the, the repercussion, you know, the reward of your actions. But if we choose to live for God, there is a reward that is coming. Why? Because God is a rewarder of they that diligently seek Him. And God is not unfaithful to, um, to overlook um, all the choices that we make to live right and to live godly. In this, ungod uh, in this ungodly generation. So I, I, I urge you and I encourage you to carry on 
you know, um, and trust in the Holy Spirit to help you make choices that set you apart from this generation. You don't have to go with a crowd. No, there's no need to go with a crowd. If the crowd are going in the right direction, feel safe to go in, the, in that direction. But if they're not, seek the Lord and He will teach you, He will lead you in, 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 in making the right decision. Okay, shall we go to the book of Isaiah, please? Would you please open to the book of Isaiah chapter 1? Uh, like I said, the first 39 chapters of the book of Isaiah was more, uh, it was more of God um, um, expressing his, um, his, his heart to his, his, to his people who have betrayed um, their relationship with God, who have pursued their own goals and uh, forsaken the God of their fathers and chosen their own idolatrous way. So let's go. Um, Isaiah chapter 1 from verse 1. The vision of Isaiah the son of Amos, which he saw concerning Judah, and Jerusalem in the days of Isaiah, Jotham, Ahaz, Ezekiah, king of Judah. Hear, O heaven, and give, and give air, O earth, um, for the Lord has spoken. I have nourished and brought up children, and they have rebelled against me. The ox knows his owner, and the donkey is master's crib. But Israel does not know. My people do not consider. Alas, sinful nation, a people laden with iniquity, a brood of, a brood of evil vipers, children who are corruptors. They have forsaken the Lord. They have provoked to anger the Holy One of Israel. They have turned away backward. Why should you be stricken again? You will revolt more and more. The whole head is sick and the whole heart faints. From the sole of the foot even to the head, there is no soundness in it, but wounds and bruises and putrefying sores. sores. They have not been closed up or bound up or stewed with ointment. Your country is desolate. Your cities are burned with fire. Strangers devour your land in your presence. And it is desolate as overthrown by strangers. So the daughter of Zion is left as a boot in a vineyard, as a hut in a garden of cucumber and, and a besieged city. Unless the Lord of hosts has left to us a very small remnant, we will have become like Sodom. We will have become, we will have been made like Gomorrah. Hear the word of the Lord, you rulers of Sodom. Give ear to the law of our God, you people of Gomorrah, for to what purpose is the multitude of your, of your sacrifices to me, says the Lord. I have had enough of burnt offering, of rams and of fat fed cattle. I do not delight in the blood of bulls or of lambs or goat. When you come to appear before me, who has required these from your hand to trample my court? Bring no more futile sacrifices. Incense is an abomination to me. The new moons, the Sabbaths, and the calling of assemblies. I cannot endure iniquity and, and the sacred meetings. Your new, your new moons and your appointed feasts, my soul hates. They are troubles to me. I am weary of bearing them. When you spread out your hands, I will hide my eyes from you. Even though you make many prayers, I will not hear. Your hands are full of blood. Wash yourselves. Make yourself clean. Put away the evil of your doing from before my eyes. Cease to do evil. Learn to do good. Seek justice. Rebuke the oppressor. Defend the fatherless. Plead for the widow. Come now, let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, though... Um, they, they shall be as white as snow. Though they are red like crimson, they shall be as wool. If you are willing and obedient, you shall eat the good of the land. But if you refuse and rebel, you shall be devoured by the sword. For the mouth of the Lord has spoken. You know, the, the chapter talks about a holy God. Almost, almost uh, recounting what he's done. Uh, for the nation, where he has by his mighty power delivered them from the oppressive regime in Egypt. Why? When he delivered them through the many dangers in the wilderness and in the desert, and he brought them to a place, a land that flows with milk and honey. And how did they repay this good God who had been so gracious to them? They rebelled against him. They, they chose to follow the many idolatrous uh, um, uh, practices of the people around um, around them. They, they became vulnerable. Their lands were devoured and, and diseases uh, ravaged their, their, their cities. The people that were protected by God became vulnerable. Why? Because that's what sin does, isn't it? 
The Bible says that his, his, his hands are not too short that, that he cannot reach out and help. And his ears are not deaf that he can't hear you when you, when you pray. But you would notice in that, in, that, in that chapter that I've just read, he says, when you call, I'm not going to answer. When you lift up your hands, I'm going to hide my face. Is it that God doesn't want to answer? Isn't, isn't, it, isn't it the same God that says, call upon me and I will answer you? you know, and I will show you greater matter things that you do not know before. But what happens is sin contaminates you. Sin contaminates you. Sin makes you open to demonic attack. Didn't the Bible say, he that breaks the wall, the serpent shall bite, and he that drinks, digs a pit shall fall into it. When you continue in sin, remember, the Bible says, he that, born, he that is born of God is not sin. It's not saying that he that he there is born of God never does anything wrong. What he's saying in that verse is he that is born of God does not continue in sin. When you make a habit of sin, you open up yourself to demonic attack. And, and the devil will, will, will eat you up and have you for lunch. Because what the devil does is he steals, he kills, and he destroys. He doesn't do anything good. There is nothing good that the enemy does. And when you when you continue to indulge in sin, you open up yourself to the ministry, so to say, of the devil. You give him the allowance to steal, to kill, and to destroy. Sin also removes you from the covenant. The covenant of God remains true. His word remains true. His promises to you remain true. But when you continue his sin, you suspend the covenant because God cannot be double-handed. He cannot bless you when you are in sin. He wants to bless you. The minute you repent and call upon him, he, he, he lifts you up and embraces you. But you're going to have to turn back to the God of your salvation. Sin limits the blessings from your life as well. So, you know, what God, what God was saying here to the nation of Israel is, I, 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 I'm, I'm, I'm all right with, with the Sabbath because it was God that called the Sabbath. You know, these various other, other uh, practices and ceremonies that God was saying, hey, you know, don't, don't do them no more. Um, um, he called them the Sabbath and the new moon and, and all of that. God called those occasions. But what God is saying here is, listen, I am not interested in your religiosity. I am interested in your heart. I, I, want you to, I want you to be rather than to do. You see, if all we want to do is just do the religious things, because it's so easy to do the religious thing. You can go sleep with somebody else's wife and pay your tithe in church. You can be a, a, um, a horrible wife at home and come to church and lead worship like no man's business. Um, you could be um, a wife beater and preach a great sermon. You could be a, um, an idolatrous uh, preacher with children out of, uh, outside of your marriage, dotted all over the place, and preach a powerful sermon. As you see, God, God reckons with the heart. God reckons with the heart and not so much you know, uh, what, what we do. What we do gets rewarded from God when our heart is right. But God will not bypass our heart to reward the work of our hand. Now, God is so much more interested in your heart. Now, there's something I want to say very quickly uh, about the prophet Isaiah. The prophet Isaiah wasn't just prophesying to the church. He was prophesying to the nation. I'm, I'm believing God that in my lifetime, a voice is going to rise up from within the church that will speak to the nations. We have so many nations in a world today where we, we have big churches, massive churches. There are places where people boast of the biggest congregation in the world and still there is no clear voice to the nation. I mean, the God of Joseph that positioned Joseph in the palace to speak to the authorities of, of his time. The God of Daniel that positioned Daniel in the palace to speak to the authorities that be. The, the God of Isaiah that propelled him to speak to the kings of his time. And the kings took attention. I believe he's still alive today because the Bible says, I the Lord your God, I change not. So I'm trusting God, I'm believing God. I'm looking for that day that the, vo the voice of God will, will arise from amongst us and speak to the nations and I know some some other people uh, some other people may have um, this opinion well shouldn't we separate the church from the state well uh, I have a different view about that see 
because I mean, we live in a community. We observe the oppression uh, of, the, of, the, of the fatherless. We, we, uh, we observe the oppression of people. We observe the injustice in our nation. We, in our nations, we see um, the iniquity, um, sometimes perpetrated even by, by lawgivers in our, in, our, in our community. Is God expecting us to turn the other eye and just focus um, on the church? I beg to differ. I believe that God wants, wants there to be a prophetic word that speaks, that speaks, that makes sense, that calls people to order, that challenge the authorities to be and calls people back to God. I believe that's, that's partly what it means that we are the light of the world. We don't just do so that others see. We, we do and we give a prophetic direction to a nation and we speak to our community and they listen. But in order for that to happen, they have to see the power of God in our life. They have to see the wisdom of God in our life. So I believe that the church, the church must get ready. We must get ready and position ourselves for, for a day that is upon us where the church of God will, will rise up and speak in wisdom and speak in power and the councils and the, 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 the members of parliament and the, 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 the senators and the, the lawmakers will knock on our door to hear what the Spirit of God has to say. So the question that I want you to um, to consider you know as we round up is um, why is it today that there is no clear voice from the church in our in our nations you know um, if you live in England for example do you think there is a clear voice from the church in our nation and if there isn't why is why is that the case talk about that but the Lord bless you have a great week enjoy the rest of your week and make sure you keep warm keep safe